All right. Well, again, we want to thank you for coming to the Roy Branson Legacy Sabbath School. We've had a change, and we're going to have Gary Chartier uh, to continue uh, sharing with us. Um, and so, and, and Gary, um, you know, in the old days, we used to call these people Minutemen. Those are the people that we would call at the last moment, and they would be able to fill in for it. So today, you're a Minuteman, Gary. I greatly appreciate it. David appreciates it. And um, we all do. So I'd like to start out by reading Psalms 103. Bless the Lord my soul, my innermost heart. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord my soul and forget none of his benefits. He pardons all my guilt and heals all my suffering. He rescues me from the pit of death and surrounds me with constant love and tender affection. He contents me with all good in the prime of life, and my youth is ever new like an eagle's. So we bow our heads. Father in heaven, we want to thank you again for this day. Um, we ask that you be in a special way with David and be with those in attendance to him. Uh, be with me, uh, Gary, as well as he speaks to us, and may your spirit watch over this meeting today. We pray in your name. Amen. Okay, Gary, um, yeah. I'm going to turn this over to you in just one moment. I, I did have one question. Maybe some of the people would like to know. You are in the School of Business. So can you just kind of tell us what your schedule looks like? Because normally your type of background doesn't uh, include business, does it? Well, you know, business schools attract a variety of people, uh, sometimes fairly idiosyncratic. Um, I, uh, I joined the business school faculty at La Sierra part-time in 1999, full-time in 2001, um, on the strength of, I guess, two things. Uh, you know, of course, I had a, uh, a PhD that could broadly be described as a PhD in ethics, and I was finishing law school, and these things uh, uh, might seem to have some relevance to what happened uh, in, the, in the business school. Um, you know, over time, I've done a pretty broad range of, uh, of things, uh, things there, uh, though, you know, I think the, the ethics-related stuff has certainly been, uh, has certainly been uh, important on an ongoing basis. Um, you know, it may be of uh, interest or it may just be a source of amusement uh, if I note that this fall, for the first time in 20 years, I'll be doing a course in managerial communication. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, that's not normally what I do. Uh, probably the bulk of my time of late has been taken up with various iterations of a, a course we call Values in the World of Business, in which we've talked about everything at different times from friendship in the workplace to global poverty uh, to uh, uh, actually the next time around, we're going to talk about so-called venture or strategic philanthropy. So it's provided a variety of opportunities for students to think about uh, uh, kind of big picture issues related to their uh, uh, work lives that they might not otherwise think about. But I do sometimes find myself doing other things like this, uh, like this uh, managerial communication course. Uh, I'm the associate dean, so that means I spend a fair amount of my time doing bureaucratic stuff. And uh, my dean, who is uh, an amazingly gracious and supportive guy, uh, ensures that uh, I can also spend a lot of time uh, doing, doing research and writing. So it's, uh, it's a bit of a mix. Okay, well, thank you for saying that to us. I am now going to turn the time over to you, and um, it's yours. Thank you again for coming. Yeah, of course. So it's always a pleasure to be here. You know, I mean, I wouldn't be responsible for uh, what, uh, uh, you know, we're now calling the Jack Provencia Legacy class if it hadn't been for Dave, right? So Dave and I, uh, uh, you know, I, I guessed it intermittently in that class, and then Dave and I did it together, and then uh, Dave, uh, I think, decided he needed a break, and I took it over. Uh, and uh, so it's, uh, I'm, I'm more than happy to be part of, you know, of any group that, uh, of course, that Dave's part of. And so whenever I've had the chance to be part of, uh, of this group's conversations, I've been both honored and pleased to, to do that. Um, so, uh, 
understandably uh, enough, uh, at, you know, given that this was a last minute uh, request, uh, Dave said, talk about what you want to talk about. So it seemed as if the simplest thing to do might be uh, to pick up uh, on uh, uh, what's going on uh, with uh, the lesson and uh, with what our friends in Silver Spring uh, invite us to think about. Uh, that's uh, certainly where our conversation took us in the uh, the uh, Provencial Legacy class uh, in the last hour. Um, so I want to I want to get at a question that I hope I can frame aptly for this group. Um, let me offer some background and then and then I'll see about framing the question. So we might consider um, uh, starting with a uh, a biblical passage that certainly uh, you know gets some attention in the spectrum commentary on the lesson for this week, uh, the place uh, uh, I and uh, the members uh, of our class uh, usually begin. Uh, let's go here to Matthew 27 and uh, start with verse 45. Um, From noon on, darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon, and about three o'clock, Jesus cried with a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lemma sabachthani, that is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of the bystanders heard it, they said, this man is calling for Elijah. At once, one of them ran and got a sponge, filled it with sour wine, put it on a stick, and gave it to him to drink. But the other said, wait, let's see whether Elijah will come to save him. Then Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and breathed his last. And the, uh, the line here, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me, of course, comes uh, in turn from Psalm 22. And it's very powerful uh, to envision, very powerful to think about um, the crucified Jesus uh, crying out in these words, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And doubly so um, in light of the way in which over time uh, uh, Christians have come to discern God in Jesus. And so to identify Jesus as God incarnate is in the nature of the case to prompt a puzzle uh, and not just a, a barely or narrowly intellectual one when we think about uh, a passage like this. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Jesus is um, immersed in a sense of abandonment here. Uh, certainly there, there seems to be some of that in the uh, Gospels, various depictions of what happens in Gethsemane as well. And um, uh, we see uh, Jesus um, caught up in, uh, in a sense of abandonment, but also in, uh, in suffering, not just then in physical suffering, uh, deeply uh, destructive uh, and uh, and painful as as that obviously is, but also at the same time, in uh, uh, a sense of of suffering that comes from what seems to be the disruption of the awareness of God's presence that has obviously been profoundly important throughout uh, the public ministry of Jesus. Right, Jesus, who has a sense of God as his Abba, his Father, and uh, of God as therefore present and supportive at all times, now uh, finding himself uh, on the cross, uh, sees in this, experiences in this, uh, a kind of abandonment that's clearly uh, wrenching uh, for him, and thus adds a further layer of suffering uh, on top of what happens with the uh, uh, the physical suffering that he's that he's undergoing in the course of this this horrible death. Um, as we 
as Christians have looked at the, um, the, the suffering of Jesus, it has been natural, I think, um, given, uh, again, the developing uh, conviction uh, that Jesus uh, is God incarnate to understand that the sufferings of Jesus must in some important way be predicated of the person uh, who is at the same time uh, God the Word, God the Logos, and at the same time um, the human Jesus of Nazareth. And this um, has been especially puzzling and unsettling for those for whom it has seemed obvious that God as perfect, um, as simple, can't finally suffer. And it's, I guess, this, this question of what we mean when we think about divine suffering and what we see about God as suffering uh, in, in and through the experience of Jesus that I want us to, to think about today. And so um, this requires a little, a little background, and perhaps that background can, you know, will, will initially seem a bit dry, but I think it's, I think it's important. So Christians understanding God as perfect and as simple have taken that to mean that all, as it were, traffic between God and the world is finally one way. God influences the world, but the God, world doesn't influence God. And uh, I grew up um, influenced by a generation of teachers, um, you know, as an undergraduate, uh, I would obviously have counted Rick Rice first among those, but, you know, all sorts of people. I then, you know, certainly my, my dissertation advisor, uh, Brian Hevelthwaite, and people I, I was reading when I was a graduate student in, in theology. Um, I think would have, I think all of these people increasingly took it for granted that that was just a mistake, that the idea of uh, God as unaffected by the world in, in any final sense um, had to be wrong, and that uh, indeed it was important to recognize a dynamic two-way relationship uh, an interactive relationship between God and the world. And this represented a pretty striking contrast with the approach that we often call classical theism. And classical theism, uh, the sort of view that, uh, you know, we might associate with many, many centuries of careful uh, Christian reflection on uh, uh, God and God's relationship with the world, uh, again, emphasized that to understand God as perfect was to understand God as, um, as not uh, affected uh, by the world, but as affecting the world. And that's far too simple. And there's obviously been a great deal of profound and uh, insightful work done on this topic by proponents of classical theism who've sought to understand how to square the picture of God um, revealed in and through Jesus, uh, how to square that picture with um, uh, the uh, uh, simultaneously affirmed uh, understanding of divine perfection. Um, by the 20th century, the beginning of the 20th century, it was just becoming increasingly common to resist and indeed reject that view. And so the view that I got to know through the work of Rick Rice and then later, you know, other people like Keith Ward and Richard Swinburne and my advisor, Brian Hebblethwaite, uh, all of that really seemed to be, at least in Anglo-American circles, very much the dominant view. Uh, it had moved from being a sort of contested position at the beginning of the 20th century 
uh, through to being what felt to me like the dominant view by the end of the 20th century. So it's been really interesting to observe in the last few years the emergence of a resurgent affirmation of classical theism on the part of a range of people influenced by Thomas Aquinas and by the, the Greek fathers uh, who said that the objections leveled against uh, the, the classical view of God as, uh, uh, as simple and as uh, uninfluenced uh, by the world, um, that this, uh, this, uh, these objections turn out not to be um, finally uh, successful ones. And uh, uh, we're not going to, to get to the bottom of, of this, I think, really fascinating conversation. When I contemplate the, the current state of play in this debate, and I'm, I'm obviously a, an amateur here, it's not where I've spent my time. Uh, I do have interests in, in philosophical theology, but they haven't been specifically on this question of divine so-called aseity uh, and immutability and impassibility. But when I think about this stuff, um, I'm struck by, on the one hand, as it seems to me, uh, what seems like the real risk associated with the idea of a one-way relationship between God and the world, because such an idea seems to me to potentially treat God as the only agent and to treat creatures and to, to, to deny creaturely agency, and finally, uh, I think it has to be said, the reality of creation, to deny that creation is real at all. And uh, indeed, uh, one influential thinker uh, who's uh, contributed to this uh, recent conversation that I've mentioned uh, says uh, quite clearly, you know, we, uh, we ought to be monists. Right. Uh, uh, and uh, that means coming at least very close to saying God's the only reality there is. And you can't be, I think, a Christian who believes in creation and who believes in uh, uh, the reality of evil and simply deny uh, that there's something to the uh, to the world. Uh, it can't just be collapsed into God. On the other hand, uh, however, uh, you know, thinkers like this uh, do, it seems to me, come often just a hair's breadth away from, from doing that. I think we want to be we want to be very careful about that. As I suggested in, in uh, the things that I've written about this, uh, whatever else we say about God's relationship to the world, I think has to begin with the uh, recognition that what happens in the world is very frequently contrary to God's intentions. And that I think has to mean the world is real and uh, that it is capable of, as it were, pushback against God. On the other hand, um, while I absolutely think therefore that the attempt to just uh, re-embrace uh, 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 classical theism uh, at any rate, requires a lot more work if it's going to be made uh, uh, viable. I'm not yet convinced uh, for the reasons that I've that I've mentioned. Um, on the other hand, I also think that when we talk about divine suffering, um, we need to be careful. Now, I don't think we need to be careful for exactly the reason that proponents, some proponents of of classical theism seem to think. That is, they seem to think that what's wrong with the idea of divine suffering is that it involves uh, the idea of God as responding to what's going on in the world. And uh, that that gives the world, they think, too much capacity to uh, affect God and that we shouldn't, we shouldn't accept that. Um, but I, what I do want to suggest is that we have to think carefully about what the language of suffering means and about whether we might not run the risk of being unduly glib uh, or facile in using that language. I think, again, uh, this was really what drove a lot of the 20th century development that I referred to earlier, 
Uh, it's not just the logical puzzles, real though they are, associated with classical theism, but it was the idea that I think people wanted to have um, the confidence that God was, as it were, in the trenches with them, that God was suffering with them. And there's something surely right about that. Um, and we don't, I think, want to be in any way dismissive of that. But I think we also need to be careful about what we say there uh, for uh, what may seem like a, a fussy technical reason to do with how we think about, how we ought to think about the language of suffering um, more generally and, the, and more broadly, the, the language of, uh, of emotion. So what I'm getting at here is that uh, of course, there are different ways that we can understand what uh, an emotion is. But I at least think that uh, there's a lot to be learned from the neuroscientist Antonio Damasio, who's talked about, uh, you know, first in, uh, in a book called uh, Descartes' Error from uh, what, 1993 or so, um, and uh, has gone on to, to talk about this uh, in more recent work. Damasio is a neuroscientist, but certainly I think a, you know, a philosophically informed one. Um, Damasio has basically said, look, an emotion we should understand is a kind of physical marker of a cognitive shortcut, right? So I learn, uh, you know, that the, the, the emotion serves the purpose of giving me a quick encapsulating signal, a signal that encapsulates information um, that allows me to respond quickly to a situation in which I find myself. And um, so the um, physical encapsulation that uh, often comes through, say, the release of a given hormone in the brain or whatever, and the resulting uh, sensation that I experience, um, this serves the purpose of saving me the need to uh, give a lot of detailed thought and, uh, and so forth to sorting through a particular problem, but instead um, a, a judgment about the right response to that problem is encapsulated uh, in, this, uh, in this sensation. Now, um, I, I think that that at least captures much of what's going on uh, when we think about our, our experiences of, uh, of uh, making emo you know, emotional judgments, uh, that uh, our emotions help us to um, uh, help to embody uh, insights that we've gained and share those with us quickly in ways that allow us to, to make, uh, make good judgments uh, quickly. So it seems to me pretty clear that um, while there's something important going on, we, we might want to talk about God, let us say, uh, as experiencing an emotion, clearly God doesn't need emotions in this sense. So we certainly want to say that with respect to the loss that takes place in the world, that God is fully cognizant of that loss, uh, that God knows what we are experiencing when we undergo the loss. It's not, God isn't just aware of what's happening from the outside. God's aware of our experience uh, from the, in, you know, knows what we from the inside are experiencing. And God's aware of the, the meaning and the value and the significance to us and to God of what goes on. And all of that, all of that seems right. Um, but the language, uh, sometimes it seems to me, of suffering when applied to God, uh, sometimes seems to suggest that God's own life is a sort of immediate, you know, kind of replication on a larger scale of human mental life. And I think the problem with that, again, is that it fails to catch the difference between the function that um, uh, emotional uh, suffering or other kinds of emotions play in our lives and what they could be 
uh, imagined to, to play in, in God's own life, that God doesn't need those shortcuts. God can experience, absolutely must experience the losses that we experience, knows them with us and cherishes us uh, as we experience them. Uh, but that's different, I think, from sort of projecting onto God uh, in a way that makes God uh, simply a kind of, uh, uh, you know, particularly large creature who functions rather, uh, rather the way we do. So I guess that's what I, what I find myself uh, thinking about in connection with this, uh, this cluster of issues. Um, do we want to talk about, uh, about divine uh, suffering? If so, what do we mean by that? What does uh, the story of Jesus contribute to our understanding of uh, what we might mean in talking about that? And uh, how does understanding uh, God in this way uh, contribute to our own understanding of uh, uh, what we undergo when things, uh, when, when we experience losses uh, and injuries in our lives? So. Um, I guess that's that's where I would hope to direct our conversation today. I realize this is a group that doesn't always spend much time focused on the uh, uh, agenda provided us by our friends in Silver Spring, and I think that's all to the good. I would be happy if uh, I think if uh, the uh, provincial class, the same uh, people there, often say, uh, in effect, we'd rather stick with the lesson because if we have visitors, uh, at least they'll know what they're getting into. Uh, they'll have an idea of the topic, and that's fair enough. In any case, I think this particular topic, uh, prompted by today's lesson, is worth further conversation, and it's that conversation uh, into which I want to invite uh, this morning. So Forrest, I think that takes it back to you. Um, unless we want to do a break or you want me to just start uh, fielding yeah, questions. I, yeah, yeah, I think that would be good. Uh, so uh, Monty, you take, you take it for now. I see Simona's hands up already. So um, go with it. So we're going to go, okay, get started on that. Okay, first of all, I want to uh, lay some of the ground rules for the sheriff. I'm gonna uh, aim to have one question at a time. So you may have multiple questions that you wanna ask. So ask one question and raise your hand again and I'll get you back in the queue. Um, sometimes of course, there's a, fo a true follow-up question to your original question. And I we wanna do those in context. Uh, so that's a special case. I'm also going to, to the degree that I can jump between our male and female members. Um, and so with that, and, and please try to keep your, if, especially if you're making comments, keep those uh, to a moderate length. Um, let's, I'm gonna start with Simona and then we'll go to David and then I've got Peter. Simona. And I see Anastasia also has her hand up. Oh, okay, wonderful, gotcha. Thank you for that tip. So uh, I think the view of the, of the emotion that you presented is relatively simplistic and probably not very much in line with the uh, majority of research that's conducted today. Emotions are very complex. And if you consider that we are allegedly uh, created in God's image, then that image would have to contain emotions as well. Uh, I cannot believe that we are so different from God in this respect. Secondly, if you consider the fact that we are the creation or the sons and daughters of God, how would you feel watching your son or daughter suffer? You may not have the same immediate sense of suffering, but you definitely do suffer. And there is a connection there. And that emotional connection is definitely present, I believe, between God and this world. I mean, from the very beginning, the, the murder of Abel, uh, 
you know, going forward, you can you can go so many times. God is talk, speaking of, of uh, his emotions, of how he sees us and how he loves us and how he cares for us and how he is hurt by us and so on and so on. So I believe that um, there is responsiveness there because it's a, a level of relationship that requires response and requires two sides to a relationship. So I guess I would say, I think, um, as I suggested earlier, we ought to be very hesitant about embracing the classical view in accordance with which the God world relationship is a one way, one way relationship. I think I agree with you entirely, Simona, that we ought to um, affirm the reality of the created world and to affirm the reality of the created world is there is therefore to affirm in some important sense um, a two-way uh, movement uh, between God and the world. As I suggested, I don't think that the um, resurgent affirmation of, of classical theism um, quite convinces me that its proponents are um, sufficiently committed to um, to the reality of the of the created world, and that may be may be unfair to them. It often seems to me as if they have to struggle uh, quite a bit to uh, to say what I think needs saying about the. Uh, uh, the genuine reality uh, of the world. Uh, I think they they come too quickly uh, to talk in terms of uh, in terms that seem by their own admission cl often close to monism. And uh, so while they have to be right that to affirm the reality of God as the world's transcendent creator, um, they. Uh, and that means there's a qualitative distinction between God and the world. At the same time, I think uh, the conclusion that we should understand the God-world relationship as, as one way seems to me to be uh, to be a mistake. So I agree with you uh, with you entirely about that. Um, I don't think that whatever we say uh, ought to uh, ought to deny that. Um, I also think uh, I want to agree that the um, um, our being made in God's image has to mean that there are uh, important analogs in the divine life to our experiences. Um, and of course, therefore, our emotional experiences. I think the, the, the interesting and complex question is what the analogs are um, and whatever we say about that, and that's undoubtedly something we can, we can return to, but whatever we say about that, uh, I think we need to to say in a way that takes seriously um, the important differences between creator and creature, between infinite and finite, uh, and so forth. So I think, um, on the one hand, we ought to resist the attempt uh, on the part, I think, we ought to at least be hesitant about the, the uh, uh, attempt on the part of proponents of classical theism to um, frame the, the relationship between God and the world in a way that's, that's so radically different that there can be no dynamic character to it, no interaction. Um, on the other hand, I think we ought to be very hesitant also about any way of thinking or talking that doesn't recognize the, uh, uh, you know, the infinite qualitative gap between between creature and creator, and we have to think about how to talk about uh, uh, what we say about God uh, in light of that. Um, that doesn't that that doesn't fill out positive content, 
Uh, it just, I think, is a is an expression, perhaps, of of what I think of as a as a need for precaution and hesitancy. Okay, thank you, Simona and Gary. Uh, next on my list is David, and after David, I'm going to go to Anastasia and then to Peter. David, you're on. David, you're on. Yeah, as I sat here and listened further, I'm not so sure I have much more to add to what Gary and Simona have already said, but just maybe some different wording. I um, wrote a song once that started with, through corridors of space, one beholds a weeping face. And I don't think, it wasn't my intention to be anthropomorphic, but rather to be more seriously ontological. That is to say, I think that's the way it is. If scripture says that um, he can feel our infirmities, we can understand why it's possible for at least one member of the Godhead to genuinely suffer because he, ended, he entered into the world that he created uh, of the creatures that he created and he suffered among them carrying the load of the entire weight of the world's sin upon him, no greater suffering could he have experienced than that which he, he um, had on the cross. And so um, clearly the issue of suffering, God knows what it means to suffer. Even God the Father through Christ and, 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 and separating himself, uh, his presence from Christ on the cross and Undoubtedly, that was a kind of suffering to, to have to withdraw from Jesus. Um, so in my mind, there's no question about God's ability to understand suffering because indeed he did suffer. And I think he still suffers as he looks at this world and the, and the state of its condition. So as to relationship, you know, I certainly disagree with classical theism in that regard as well. As Christians, Adventists and otherwise, we're encouraged to form a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. So if he, if he entered into our world, into our existence, to be among us, he related to us then and by his Holy Spirit, uh, he continues to relate to us and allow us to communicate and relate to him even now. Th thanks, David. I, uh, I think it's important absolutely to stress the relational character of uh, the God world relationship uh, I mean, that just sounds redundant put that way, but I guess I think uh, whatever else we want to say, I think it's finally a mistake to talk, at least without a lot of qualification and nuancing and, and so forth that, uh, that really, you know, kind of changes things up significantly, um, to talk uh, as I think, uh, you know, classical views often have uh, of a of a really of a one way uh, kind of kind of relationship between God and the world. I think that's that's right. And I think the um, I think the image of of divine tears and divine suffering. I think those things capture something important because it seems to me we want to say, again, God is fully aware of what happens uh, to us, not just from the outside, but from the inside, fully aware of what we experience and what we undergo, and that uh, God is also fully aware of the the meaning and the significance, the value of what goes on 
uh, in the world. That's just part of what it is to take God to be uh, to be uh, unlimited, uh, unqualified in in knowledge, right? And so um, that means that uh, what happens in the world is um, is absolutely kind of encompassed within within God's awareness. And I think when you when you stop and and just say that, then perhaps somebody might worry that well, you're just saying that God has a sort of detached view. But I think the that's not at all the point. The point is to say the, 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 that's the point then of, of emphasizing that um, what happens in the world, um, uh, you know, God God is fully aware of how this how this matters, and so it enters into. Um, God's reasons for action and to what God does uh, in, you know, in relation to the world. And uh, uh, the, that meaning is, uh, you know, we have to take to be, uh, to be immediately present to, uh, to God. So I think we, we start to stumble very quickly. We start to get ourselves in trouble uh, when we uh, don't remind ourselves that the only language we have to use with respect to God is our language, uh, and yet at the same time, of course, it's our language, and uh, it, uh, uh, you know, it's very important not to uh, confuse the creator with a creature, um, and uh, the, um, you know, as uh, one of my teachers uh, used to put it, you know, we want to make sure we don't confuse the difference between God and the world with any particular difference in the world. Um, I, and I, so I think that's you know we're always walking a tightrope. I guess I would say when we when we think about these matters, because on the one hand, uh, we want to be uh, faithful to the to the reality of God as Creator and not just as a uh, you know kind of particularly large friendly creature. On the other hand, we want to recognize the reality of the created world and uh, therefore the the possibility of a, of a of a genuine relationship of genuine interaction uh between god and the world and i think we it's very easy to stumble uh, probably on either side of that tie rope okay thank you david and gary uh, next i'm going to go to anastasia and then we'll come to peter so, and I don't have any, hand, well, then I have my hand up. You can't see it. Um, so Anastasia and then Peter, you're going to be next in line. Anastasia, take it away. Thank you so much, Dr. Chartier. Um, we're privileged to have you. And the subject of suffering, of course, and as you said, in the 20th century, after the Holocaust, the schism in the French um, philosophers of the atheist existentialists and then the Christian existentialists, atheist existentialists, action, just only men can do it. The Christian existentialists and people like Bernanos mm -hmm. saying that we need both. And here's my question. Um, sometimes I feel guilty, as I said, that in another place, um, in feeling uh, not happy, but having more faith in God because he did not interfere with Christ's suffering. I cry and I feel for Christ's suffering and sacrifice because he was totally innocent. But, and then I will ask your opinion, but if God, the father, his father, had reached out and snitched him out of the cross without him suffering, I feel for me that would cause me to not believe in God the Father, because he rescues him for 32 or 30 or 20 years of suffering while we're stuck here with evil, some we deserve, some we don't. So the non-interference, I see it as a sign of love of both of them. What do you think about it? Thank you. Yes, oh, you're most welcome. Uh, thank you so much for your, you, the gracious comments with which you began and for um, a provocative question that I certainly am not going to be able to answer well. Uh, you know, I think um, I guess I would say I absolutely agree with you that um, you know, 
a, a sort of docetist view in which um, the humanity, uh, what seemed to be the humanity of Jesus of Nazareth, uh, you know, wasn't uh, wasn't real. You know, would would be a situation in which, of course, we didn't have god as incarnate at all uh it would just be a kind of uh it would be kind of joke it would be a, a an act and uh you know so i mean it's been um you know say a common muslim view that you know that there's a, a you know a, a trade that goes on and uh you know perhaps for instance judas ends up on the cross uh you know instead of jesus um I think there's a lot to a lot to learn from Muslim reflection, but that's that doesn't seem right to me. I think we I don't think we can we can say that. I think it would call into question the integrity of uh, of the world and the certainly the reality of any conviction of of Jesus as God incarnate. And you, I'm glad to see you shaking your head. I'm shaking my head with you. Um, Thank you. Yes, of course. Okay, Peter. It is your turn. Thank you for your patience. Uh, thank you, uh, Jerry, for uh, your presentation again and for challenging us with this uh, very interesting uh, matter. Well, as you know, in light of uh, the Council of Chalcedon in 451 AD, they decided that Jesus has two natures, one human and one divine and one will. But as you mentioned, that was not the end of discussion. Docetis and many other currents came up with too many different ideas and uh, throughout the centuries. And uh, my question is, what do you believe if what nature was Jesus suffering on the cross? Hmm. His suffering on his human nature or on his divine nature, on, on both natures, how he suffered on the cross. And this is one uh, question. I, I have a few others, but uh, I'll limit it to, to one. Peter, it's a, it's a pleasure to see you, and you always have thoughtful questions. Um, um, the same have... here. Um, so... It seems to me that clearly, at minimum, right, you want to say that we want to say that Jesus, um, Jesus of Nazareth, the human person, is suffering as a human person on the cross. The question is, uh, is there more to say than that? And it seems to me that a Chalcedonian view um, doesn't in any way finally answer that uh, because it doesn't tell us about what we want to say with respect to divine suffering, right? So that if there's an important sense in which we can predicate suffering of God, then there's no reason that a Chalcedonian view would in any way be inconsistent with saying that, you know, God is suffering as Jesus suffers there. Um, what we want to do with that, I guess, again, sort of depends, as I suggested earlier, on how we want to think about uh, what we mean when we, when we say God suffers. And so, you know, my sense is that um, to say that God suffers is to say that God is fully aware of what happens in the world, not only from the outside, but from the inside, and that what happens in the world, um, as it were, matters to God. God's awareness of what's going on in the world isn't just a matter of, of awareness of sort of in the abstract, but that there's a, there's a meaning and value of, uh, associated with what goes on uh, that, uh, that is also uh, fully, uh, fully present uh, uh, in, God's, uh, uh, in God's awareness. And so I think, um, you know, whether you, whatever the exact way in which you want to cash out an understanding of God as liable to loss 
and uh, and to suffering. Therefore, uh, if we think about suffering as, as kind of registering the, the the meaning or value of that loss, so God is aware is liable to loss and liable to to corresponding awareness of the vulnerability of the uh, meaning and value of that loss. Um, then I guess I think you want to say, in some important sense, um, on a Chalcedonian view. Um, the uh, uh, the suffering that we'd want to predicate would be both of uh, the the human person and of the divine person, uh, but um, I think anything we say we ought to say with with considerable hesitation, uh, given our our real limitations. But I think I, I think you'd want to say on the sort of Chalcedonian view that I would regard as most defensible, uh, you wouldn't want to limit uh the the suffering to uh uh to humanity and not have it understand it as affecting humanity but we'd have to i guess we have to think more about that thank you of course Marty, i think you had the next question didn't you well, maybe we've lost Monty. Yeah, Monty, are you here? Sorry, like I've been having a nice little conversation with my muted self. Okay. Uh, <laughs> I have lots of wonderful, insightful things to uh, ask and say. Um, so, uh, Peter, I did hear that uh, you have more questions, so I put you back into the queue. Uh, for, mm -hmm. just so you know that, and um, I actually have several questions too. But I guess he, listening to the last exchange got me thinking about one thing. So, Gary, when thank you very much for your presentation. I when I think about the suffering of Christ on the cross, well, oftentimes when I hear discussions about suffering of Christ on the cross. Uh, some people, and I forget what the movie, there was a popular movie that was done and that oh, really dropped. Yeah. Yeah. That I, I haven't seen it, that I'm told dramatized the physical suffering quite dramatically. And when I thought of that, and then when I thought about the suffering of Christ, I always thought that, yeah, there is physical suffering, but what emotion was the emotion, would the emotional suffering have been worse? And I guess this would depend on one's view of atonement. Uh, my view isn't that God took on all the sins of the world, but if he, if he was doing and, and atoned for them in a legal, I'm not, I don't take that view, but to imagine taking on all those sins, if I were to do that, if I think of all the people in the world and all the heinous things, all the things that I've done and how I feel, the guilt I feel about those, but I took on everyone else's, including I think people have done more heinous things than I have done uh, in my mind, uh, even though some of mine are, are uh, I'm terribly ashamed of. Um, that would be incredible suffering, but that's not my view of atonement. My view of atonement is Christ reaching out to us. <clears throat> um, and even there, reaching out to this sinful world and embracing it would, would be emotionally um, wrenching, I think. So I'm just wondering what your thoughts are about that in terms of the emotional suffering as part of this at atonement process. Does that re uh, come into it for you? Well, so maybe I'm... so. I mean, it seems to me that, um, right, Jesus is, um, Jesus is a human person and human persons have emotions and uh, the experience of being unjustly condemned and, you know, horribly executed uh, couldn't help but be, um, you know, emotionally powerful. 
Uh, in addition to that, though, I, it seems to me, as I tried to suggest earlier, uh, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me, I think suggests something else. It's not just a matter of, um, well, I probably, it probably suggests several things, but one thing that I, it certainly suggests is that Jesus is having an experience something like this, right, that he's... Um, uh, Jesus has understood himself over the course of his public ministry as energizing Israel in a renewal movement, it seems to me, and doing so, acting on behalf of God in history. Uh, seems to me he understands himself to be uh, to be acting on on God's behalf, to be doing what God wants, to be uh, standing where God wants him to stand, and so it might well be the case that what he's experiencing then in this moment of loss uh, on the cross then is uh, is not just the predictable emotions uh, that I think any of us would experience it, you know, being simultaneously, uh, you know, tortured by the authorities and knowing that this is, is completely unjust, but also that uh, he's been uh, forsaken, not just by his friends, uh, like Peter, but also uh, he, he fears by God, right? There's the worry that... Uh, uh, he's been doing just what uh, he understood God to uh, to want uh, him to do, and yet at the same time, uh, instead of being, as it seems in the moment, vindicated or protected, uh, he's been abandoned, and uh, and so there's something uh, profoundly uh, unsettling. Uh, obviously there, profoundly disruptive. And uh, uh, it seems to me, uh, again, there's, there's something emotionally very, very powerful uh, going on there. So uh, certainly um, all of these kinds of uh, emotionally mediated uh, uh, suffering are, uh, are very much part of, of the experience of Jesus as it's presented to us there in the Gospels. Uh, so I think um, maybe there's more, Monty, that you want to say about that, but certainly I think uh, the physical suffering, uh, awful as it is, uh, you're quite right, is not at any rate, in any, in any way, the end of the story. Um, yeah. Uh, so I, I just like to say at this point, as we've come to 1130, I'd like to see if we can, if we can break at this point, that would be convenient for me. That's what I was going to suggest. Let's break for 10 minutes. It'd be uh, 20 minutes to 12 when we come back. So other people have questions, uh, raise your hand. I know Simona has another question, but uh, 10 minutes and we'll be back. Okay, and my plan going uh, male, female, we'll come back with Simona and then Peter's next in line and then we'll go from there. Okay, good enough. And I'm gonna pause Stop it, Simona. Recording. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I want us to start out with Simona, and then we will move from Simona to Peter, then Dana, uh, or Simona, yeah, Simona to Peter, to Forrest, Dana, and then Rod. Okay, Simona. Okay, thank you. Well, I, I think that, you know, there are two things that I was thinking about during this break and this nature of God and nature of sin. And I think these two natures uh, met at the cross. So in terms of nature of God, we believe that God is love, period. So, but when, you, when we think about God, we have to understand that God does not live uh, a sequential time. God lives in all time at the same time, simultaneously. So even if there is a, a single moment of suffering, that is 
literally eternal suffering for God. And we have to understand that when, when uh, Jesus came to this earth, this was not only to respond to our need, it was a response to the whole universe that in which he was uh, presented as somebody who is uncaring and who is going to disappear at the first sign of trouble. And this is God's response. God's response is that I am here to sacrifice myself literally eternally so, so that that uh, moment of suffering if that was all there was is something that exists forever in God's nature and at the same time you know to bridge this gap which is what I believe sin is it is a, it is a, a separation from the source of goodness and love and so that is that moment in which Christ, as God and human being, bridged this um, divide and took upon himself to be separated from his true nature, from, from the God side of his nature. This is the source of, of anguish and uh, sense of loneliness that uh, Christ experienced on the cross. So I think this is much wider than just our anthropocentric idea of what the sacrifice on the cross meant. It is something that is uh, beyond just uh, the purpose of our planet and sacrifice on our behalf, but it was also to confirm the nature of God as uh, someone who is loving and therefore sacrificial for the lowliest of beings in the universe. Thanks, Simona. I'm I'm still, I guess, puzzling over over what would be a what would be a helpful helpful response to what you've said. I think the um, I find myself in a in a fog and really unsure. Uh, unsure what would be what would be apt there. I think I don't feel like I have anything anything wise or or helpful uh, to to offer there. And I wonder if I if I could. Uh, ignore for the moment Monty's request uh, that uh, that we keep to a single single question. And if I could just come back to you and say um, and and ask for a question, because I, I feel like you've you, you've said a great deal that's uh, that's significant, uh, and I could just sort of respond in a scattershot way to that. But I wonder if there was something uh, that you might have wanted, especially for us to talk talk a little more about. I think that, you know, we, we spoke about uh, the suffering of God in, in a way separated from the nature of God. And I think it is really important to take into consideration what is the nature of God and how that nature was affirmed on the cross. At the same time, understanding that God does not uh, exist in a, in a sequential time like we do. You know, we, li we live right now and that we will live in the moment next. Um, God lives in all time. Is, he is omnipresent. And this is, I think, something that's intellectually difficult for, for us to understand, the wideness of God's presence. Uh, but... It is essential, I believe, in understanding what it means for God to suffer. And I believe it is also important to understand what is the nature of sin for which God sacrificed himself for. And that is this separation from the source of life and goodness and love. And so I think it's, it is uh, 
a conundrum for us because we we live in a sequential time. We live in the moment. We live through um, in a way that is very anthropocentric, very egocentric. Well, God gave himself freely without um, any reservation to save the lowliest of human beings, starting with that mass murderer on the cross next to Jesus. So I, I think it, there is a much wider view of that suffering as well as the meaning of that sacrifice when you look at the level of the universe, not just our own salvation and our egocentric and anthropocentric, earth-centric view. So, yeah, I mean, I'd, I'd absolutely want to say that God's awareness of and responsiveness to loss and injury, obviously has to be universe-wide. It can't be in some way focused just on this planet and just on us. And whenever God is revealed, whenever we see who God is and the way God is and what God does, that has to involve, I think, um, an awareness of a divine life that takes into itself, takes within itself all creaturely life and a divine awareness that includes within itself awareness of all creaturely loss and injury. Um, and not just in any way, uh, is, is in no way just limited to, to what happens in, in this world or in our, uh, in our lives. Um, I hesitate, I guess, to assume that I know too much about the precise relationship between what God does to heal and transform and liberate in other worlds, uh, the relationship between that and what God does in our world, except to say that, of course, um, what we see when God is revealed in our world is a God who cannot possibly be limited to that world. Probably if I stepped beyond that, I'd be saying more than I, more than I had, had good reason to say. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, thank you. And Gary, by the way, yes, uh, you certainly are free to do the exchange. And I like that. If we're dealing with a single question, uh, I understand the iterations and appreciate them. Let's see. Thank you, Simona. Uh, Peter, you are up. And then Forrest, Dana, and Rod. Gary, I think that it was a good thing that we had the small break to give you a little time to recharge your batteries. Um, I had uh, a few other questions, uh, but uh, another one uh, popped up into my mind following the di later discussions. My question is, what do you think uh, Jesus, when he came, he came in the nature of Adam before the fall or after the fall? And as I said, I have a few other questions. If will be more time, I, I will ask.
Yeah, I mean, I think I, I'm, I'm not, um, I'm not ecstatic about that way of putting the matter. Um, it's probably not the way I, not, I'm sure it's not the way I would, I would want to put it. I would say if we think about what the factors are that are in play in our psyches, in our lives, we think about a range of genetic factors and a range of developmental factors and a range of social factors, all of which uh, might dispose us in one way or another to, to choose unwisely or worse. Um, I think any story that we tell about why we experience those, what's going on in our our genes, what's going on in the, the processes of, of uh, uh, human development in the womb and in early childhood, and what's going on uh, in terms of the influences we experience from our, our society. I think we have to, I think we have to, exp to understand um, the humanity of Jesus as affected by all of those. I don't think there's a way, there's a plausible story about the humanity of Jesus that involves it as somehow exempted from the uh, impact of, of all of those factors. Um, so it seems to me as a result, uh, yeah, we don't, we don't assume a, a kind of radically different humanity, uh, on the part of Jesus. On the other hand, however, uh, I think it's also important to say that, you know, it's been very common, uh, for discussions of that topic in Adventism to then go on to, uh, uh, well, for, for, for both sides in, in discussions of, of that topic in Adventism, uh, both sides to assume that if one answers the question in a way that does assume that uh, there's uh, comparable, um, uh, that these, the, the impact of these relevant factors is, is somehow comparable in, in the case of Jesus, uh, that that then should lead to uh, kind of broadly perfectionist conclusions. And I don't think that's right either uh, for something like the following reason, that um, if we are to, so every, you know, everybody, um, in the conversation we're talking about, um, I think presupposes moral flawlessness on the part of Jesus. That kind of moral flawlessness, I think, is, is not explicable whether we are talking about uh, a humanity that somehow doesn't have any of these dynamics in play that we've talked about or whether it does is not explicable with respect, I think, to the, uh, to the humanity of Jesus. Um, if you're a Chalcedonian Christian, and obviously there are many other sorts of Christians, but if you're a Chalcedonian Christian and you understand Jesus to be God incarnate, um, I think it beggars belief to suppose that the one human being uh, who ends up morally flawless also happens to be, for independent reasons, the one human being who's God incarnate. And I think it, uh, you know, when we consider the possibility of that, um, you know, when we think about what it is to, to identify Jesus as God incarnate uh, in Chalcedonian terms, then I think we have to understand that as including um, you know, because God is necessarily, um, 
morally flawless. I mean, there's reasons we might hesitate to use that language, but let's let's use that language. Um, then uh, to imagine that it would be possible for God incarnate to be um, not morally flawless, even in principle, would be to be a kind of Nestorian, and so a kind of anti to take a kind of anti calcedonian view that opens up a uh, too big a gap between uh, between the humanity of Jesus and uh, and uh, the divinity of, of the word. And so I think uh, on the one hand, then short version, we want to say that the dynamics that are in play in our experience, um, I think any story we tell uh, about why we would experience genetic or social or developmental uh, uh, pressures toward, uh, toward wrongdoing would also be operative in the case of Jesus. On the other hand, um, I think the uh, distinctiveness of Jesus, if we're Chalcedonians, uh, has to be understood in a way that's inextricable from our identification of Jesus as God incarnate. You think it's safe to say that uh, uh, using uh, the Apostle Paul saying that Jesus was made like one of us, and also Isaiah talking about the sufferings of Christ, mm -hmm. that uh, basically, he he came in the human nature after the fall. I would say that the human nature of Jesus of Nazareth is human nature. And when we understand that human nature, uh, I think any any account that we give of our human nature is going to be at the same time an account uh, of of the, the human nature of Jesus to the extent that we are pressured toward uh, toward wrongdoing, we experience inner pressures toward wrongdoing on uh, on genetic, on developmental, or on social grounds. Uh, we would expect those kinds of uh, of pressures to be experienced by by Jesus too. Peter, uh, my understanding is you have additional questions, so I'll keep you in the queue. Yes. Great. Um, if, if, if Gary will not be too tired. <laughs> I mean, he has quite a bit of stamina in these sort of situations, I've noticed. Well, I know he has a lot of stamina. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's see. I'm going to go from Peter to Dana. And then Forrest, and then Rod. Forrest was next. Yeah, but we're going back and forth, uh, male, female. We. It's prerogative of the sheriff. Is that how you are going to make peace in the world? Uh, no, but anyway. uh, I, I <laughs> okay. don't know what I'll be making, but that's the way I'm going to do it. OK, OK. So to, to the group, I would really recommend watching Mel Gibson movie. It changed my understanding about the story of crucifixion. Uh, and it, it, I, I believe it changed me. And if you are committed to the Bible story, I think you should watch it, even though I, there is a lot of violence and it's tough to watch. Another uh, thing that changed my understanding of Jesus' suffering on the, on the cross was a quote uh, from uh, Marilyn McCord Adams. She said that, uh, roughly, this is the idea, on the cross, Jesus died as a victim and as a perpetrator. As a perpetrator, he carried all the sin in the world or the guilt of the sin in the world, and he died the death of a criminal, one of the worst deaths possible. And as a victim, he died as an innocent person. Uh, again, one of the worst deaths possible. And uh, I just want to say that broadened my understanding a lot. And um, as a person who lived under the communism, as a person who was a victim, I, I it, it gave me a much bigger understanding about how Jesus died for me. And also it gave me basically a way to 
understand the perpetrators and um, try to look for a way for forgiveness. So I, I don't know if, uh, Gary, you, if you want to make a comment on that. And I also have a question that is actually from last time. Um, you said that uh, the nature of God is love. And uh, I told the group afterwards, as I was reading through the Bible, it's end of September and uh, uh, we are still in the last pages of the Old Testament. And there is so much suffering that seems to come uh, from God as an, um, you know, God says, destroy all these people, destroy the women, destroy the children, kill them. How do you make peace in your heart with this account of the Bible and your commitment to the idea that God is love, which is my commitment as well? So, uh, Dan, you've put a lot of interesting things on the table, and I'm sure what I say won't be adequate with respect to all or perhaps any of them. Um, I think very highly of Marilyn, and I'm I'm sorry that that she's no longer with us. Um, there's always, I think, a great deal to to learn from her. Um, and I really like the direction you took her remarks by suggesting that. What we really need is to try to find some way to, to make peace, some way to forgive in the wake of, uh, you know, certainly in the, in the particular context which you were talking about, you've got, you know, uh, uh, profound and persistent uh, oppression and, uh, and injustice and uh, both kind of at the institutional level and then you know obviously at the level of, uh, of kind of individuals who uh, uh, go beyond uh, that institutional injustice to themselves uh, you know uh, uh, tyrannize and, and brutalize and I think that's profoundly difficult um, I I like people I have minor conflicts with people and I find it easy and important and valuable in the course of those minor conflicts to talk about the significance of, of forgiveness and loving your enemies. And uh, it all seems fairly straightforward much of the time. I have no idea, of course, how I might react uh, looking back at decades of abuse of the kind you rightly called our attention to and the, um, you know, whether in some way our identification with the crucified Jesus might help there is an interesting possibility that I hadn't uh, thought about, I think, in quite that way before, uh, whether that would provide some kind of, of psychological resource that might be, might be of value. I, um, yeah, I realize how easy it is for those of us who don't have real enemies to talk about loving enemies and how glib, and uh, that's, it's trouble. That's a troubling reminder, I think, of our own of our own limitations and my limitations there. And so, whether uh, whether Jesus is a whether you know the the image of of Jesus crucified is a way into that. That I think that's that's interesting. Um, you know, in terms of, of you know what I what I said last week. I mean, I guess my I mean that's why I, I tried to go to some lengths to lay out in advance my view that um, you know when we we understand when we when we talk about God's interaction with the world uh, and in and in particular you know somebody's uh, claims regarding God's communication with the world. Um, 
we ought to be very much aware of the degree to which human fallibility, finitude, and sin uh, come into play in our appropriation of God's influence on us and our uh, transmission of that and our narration of that. And uh, when I uh, find somebody saying that God uh, encourages genocide, uh, one possibility, of course, is just to say, well, maybe they deserved it. I think that's a horrible view. It's not a view I'm, I'm comfortable accepting. Uh, you know, there's a sort of certain, a certain kind of Calvinist view that has said, uh, for instance, in the words of the um, uh, Old Testament scholar Meredith Klein, that, well, you know, these people are going to get it in the last judgment anyway. This was just an early verdict. Um, I, I find that I find that horrible, and I think, uh, you know, in my view, when when we find people maintaining that God told them to commit genocide, we should just say, finally, they got it wrong. So that's okay. the best I can do. Right. Uh, thank, oh. thank you, Gary and Donna. I do have a uh, a little related follow up, uh, Gary, for what Donna was asking about. Uh, your Dana. statements about God and being grounded in love or being loved, you referred to five different, I don't know, arguments or approaches toward answering that question of demonstrating that God is love. And you talked about your book, uh, The Analogy of Love. Is there a chapter in The Analogy of Love that summarizes those five points or is it interspersed throughout the Oh, no, that's early on in the book. Uh, give me a second. Uh, I mean, the, the fact that there might be people here uh, interested in, in reading that book, of course, puts a smile on my face. Um, uh, and uh, But let me see if I can do a decent job of figuring out where to look for that. Uh, the last week, I added at least two cents to your coffers, I think, by buying a copy of that book. I don't know what you get. Uh, thank you. I'm really trying to tidy it up. There are some, I, I noticed, for instance, in the copy that's online, uh, there's a crucial case where the word not is missing. It's fairly embarrassing that, uh, that that's the case. Um, and uh, so I appear to be saying just the opposite of what I intend to say. Um, uh, the nice thing, I guess, is the publisher of the first edition didn't do a good job promoting the book. So I bought the rights back and, uh, you know, have, uh, you know, that second edition is one that I published so I can fix those things fairly easily. Um, but I'm sorry, Monty, that you got a less than perfect copy. Um, I, I will watch for a bizarre statement that's missing a knot and see if I can. It's, it, it's at the end of a chapter. I don't know okay. the chapter immediately. Um, okay. So I'm looking here. It's on about in the, um, it's chapter two in the book um in the sorry about this my computer is not behaving as well as it might i don't have a, a print copy in front of me unfortunately um so it's chapter two of the book the book is called love at the center and um uh it's uh, a section within that chapter called love and god talk uh, that's, Got it. uh, uh yeah so love, and I'll put that in the chat uh, as well. So if anyone else wants to refer to that, thank you very much. Of course. Um, back to our queue. So we have Forrest and then Donna has a question. So we're gonna go Forrest, Donna, Rod, then Peter. Uh, okay. Forrest, you're up. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Gary, for your presentation. Uh, I'm on to just kind of, uh, move the conversation to a, just a little different perspective here. Uh, one of the things that took me forever to realize is that the Gospels don't all agree. And yeah. we go into conflation, like the two Christmas stories. They just right. don't, you can't bring them together. Seven last words of Christ. Uh, you know, so I, I guess my question is, do we get suffering a little too much out of perspective uh, I mean, I know there are groups that are very much into suffering, uh, personal penitence and all that. Um, you know, and Mark mm -hmm. talks about Jesus uh, uh, in agony, but Luke says very, very candidly, or 
quietly. Oh, I just lost it on my iPad here. Um, then Jesus crying out with a loud voice said, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. And having said this, he breathed his last. Uh, Luke kind of makes Jesus different uh, in one sense in regard to suffering than Mark or, uh, or Matthew. Luke is almost has a Jesus who's a chatty Cathy as he goes to the cross. So what does that do for this whole concept of suffering? Do we get that out of proportion? Um, just your thoughts on that. I, I, I personally, I find it a little creepy. Uh, I pers personally don't see Jesus dying. I mean, my, my individual wrongdoings caused his death uh, because, you know, I'm just born into this whole thing. Anyway, just your, your responses to that. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, I mean, the variations in the Gospels, certainly, as you rightly note, are, are real and uh, our attempt to kind of get behind those to the events of first century Palestine uh, must, uh, I think, unavoidably be, be limited. Uh, right, our our ability to suppose that we know what's going on uh, can't be as simple as picking up a uh, harmony of the Gospels and finding that we can, you know, just just read something out of there and you know nail it all down. Um, I, I think, as I as I say in in the book, that there are profound problems with views of the death of Jesus that try to fit that into a story about um, cosmic retribution, okay? Um, and uh, here again, I think I'll, I'll beat up on the on the scholastic Calvinists because they're not here to defend themselves. Um, but I, I think um, the, uh, uh, you know, the idea that uh, what we have is, is uh, you know, this, I mean, this notion of penal substitution, right? That first of all, um, we ought to be punished and uh, that then um, God incarnate uh, takes on that punishment and uh, uh, bears it in substituted fashion, and uh, and I think that's a. I mean, it's a, it's a, it's problematic on two levels, right? So first of all, um, it's problematic because retribution is itself a mistake, right? I don't think that that uh, that there's that retribution accomplishes anything. Uh, it doesn't. Uh, uh, it's not, I am not, when, when I engage in retribution vis-a-vis -vis someone who's, uh, who's harmed me or when some third party uh, engages in retribution putatively in, on my behalf vis-a-vis -vis somebody who's harmed me, I don't benefit from that. So first of all, retribution, I think, is a, I think it's just a mistake, a notion. But then number two, if you do think retribution is a notion that makes sense, it's not the sort of thing that can be substituted. It's not the kind of thing that, uh, uh, you know, it's that can be sort of taken on uh, by somebody else. So that if, if, what, if I deserve to be punished in some way, then as long as the logic of retributive punishment persists, it doesn't make any sense to talk about shifting that retributive punishment onto somebody else. Uh, so I think we have to think in a different way entirely about um, how uh, God heals, how God liberates, and what the relationship between uh, what happens to Jesus and to God's healing and liberating activity might might be. It seems to me that uh, there are you know various things we'd want to say there. Um, you know, one of which is that Jesus suffers first of all. It seems to me because suffering is the natural consequence of his making the choices he did, Jesus. And, and I don't need, uh, I think, to resolve all the uh, complexities about the, the uh, different narratives in the gospels to, to get that right, as long as I recognize that being um, politically dangerous from the standpoint of the leaders of the uh, community of Israel and 
also being politically dangerous from the standpoint of the Romans, predictably got Jesus killed. Uh, it's at about that level that I think we can be uh, we can be pretty confident. And the fact is that by um, proving himself to be a disturber of the peace over the course of his public ministry by offering a picture of what um, Israel could be like as a, as a community that was not marked by fear of uh, the other, but uh, rather by, by welcoming uh, the, uh, the wider world, being a light to the Gentiles, be having arms open uh, to that wider world. Um, and by undermining the authority of those who uh, maintained an exclusivistic and uh, uh, puritanical view of God, um, Jesus predictably put himself in the way of those who would cause his death. And his death, I think, shouldn't be seen as a some kind of complicated cosmic transaction, but should be seen instead uh, as precisely an outcome, a predictable outcome of his being faithful uh, to God, being faithful to his mission in the way that he that he lived it out. Um, there's a lot more to be said about what, what you put on the table for us, but that's at least where I'd start. I'll give you 14 more credits for that. Okay, part. well, thank you very much. Uh, and by the way, uh, last week, Monty said, he was going to take you out to lunch sometime. I, I pay for it, so I, I, I yeah. want to be part of that too. Oh, it's always a pleasure to see both of you guys. <laughs> okay, back to you, Monty. So, Forrest, is that your way of saying you want a free lunch from Monty? Was that was that what that was? Yeah, yeah, that's basically what I was saying. Okay, that's that's what I picked up there. <laughs> All right, let's see, Donna, I think. Uh, yeah, <clears throat> yes, Donna. Uh, I appear now as, as Jeff most of the time. Um, I think, Gary, in answering the both Dana and Forrest, you've answered some of the things that I was going to try to bring up. By the way, I'm very happy to be confused for Dana. I would like to take on that personality. <laughs> uh, uh, she's much more articulate uh, and erudite and better informed in many ways about these uh, topics. Um, I always had, as you know, um, a lot of difficulty with uh, or reconciling this God that needs a sacrifice for the sins of the world. Um, maybe we make God in not in our own image, but in what we wish were our own image by declaring that he is love and his purpose is to save us all and we are his children and he's going to bring us to his feet someday in some fashion. At the same time, we have what seems to me this terrible theology of a God who needs a sacrifice. It seems that must arise out of very primitive theology, if you call it theology of, of Old Testament and even further back in history. Mm -hmm. of, people who saw awful things happen and thought they must be things that happened because uh, of uh, the gods or a god that was visiting this upon the world. We tend to invest God, do we not, with our own characteristics. You say retribution is wrong, but it is uh, very satisfying in some cases, perhaps satisfying to some element in our nation, that, our nature that we wish wasn't there. Of course, uh, absolutely. We, 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 you know, at, at capital executions, family members are often invited to witness the death of the perpetrator or the person they think was the perpetrator of, a, of a, an evil upon their own family member or loved one. Um, interviewing people who come out of that, of a witness, uh, having witnessed something like that, doesn't seem to, um, it, they don't seem happy, that, but there is a certain closure. Okay, this is done. Uh, and, and I think we end up attributing that kind of feeling perhaps to God. I don't know when, you know, you and probably Peter know when the doctrine of the Trinity arose, so that uh, in, sometime after Christ, when we had to make him into uh, part of the Godhead. And we made even three, we made it, made it into three, not just two. Uh, 
but it seems very artificial and contrived to me. And so I have difficulty with it. You know, ultimately this whole view of an angry God who needs some blood in order to uh, reconcile himself or herself with the rest of us. Um, there's a little bit of a rambling, <laughs> but uh, there's, there's some connection among, among the dots. Um, you can comment. I, I'm not sure actually how to, how, how to end my question because I'm not sure what my question is exactly, but do we really have a God of love and no. this kind of suffering and can we reconcile that? Doesn't seem to me we can. Yeah, so um, <laughs> as always, uh, I think uh, you uh, understate your own insightfulness, Donna. Um, I think that um, what I what I said, especially uh, I think to to Peter, I, I hope will will it's clear be uh, intended as, as directly responsive to to what you said. I think the uh, the idea of um, a um, you know a God who's who's interested in a uh, uh, you know blood sacrifice. Is a, is a pretty ghoulish idea. And then the, the kind of further uh, sort of epicycle of a God who's interested in the blood sacrifice and then provides such a blood sacrifice to God's self, uh, I think that only makes matters more complicated and more difficult to sustain. Uh, I, I don't think that's, a, as I said, I, the, the whole, the, the underlying logic of retribution, I think is, is just profoundly uh, just mistaken. I agree with you 100% that we feel uh, very often uh, deep uh, desire uh, for retribution and uh, may over the short term feel satisfied uh, in some way when it's occurred. And I don't mean for a second to deny uh, the, uh, my, you know, my own experience sometimes of, of very uh, dark retributive impulses. Uh, but I just, but I think when we take a step back, it's just very hard to see how that can be in any way, uh, in any way defended. And um, the, uh, um, you know, the picture um, of a, um, you know, a sort of odd kind of split within, within divinity uh, that uh, is sometimes associated here uh, with uh, uh, the image of sacrifice and, and retribution and substitution is, is particularly odd and troubling, and we certainly shouldn't uh, Shouldn't shouldn't affirm that, um, you know. If we that that doesn't mean that I've solved the the you know the problem at all of um, you know whether whether we're we're right to talk about uh, uh, love as as God's nature. I think that's that's really central to uh, uh, the uh, the Bible and to the Christian tradition, but that doesn't mean there aren't things in the Bible and the Christian Christian tradition that tug in very different directions, and uh, yeah, maybe we're maybe we're wrong to treat those as central. Um, I hope we're not, and uh, you know, obviously, I think there are you know reasons we can give for for you know opting one way rather than another, um, but uh, one thing I'm very sure about is that if we have to choose between um, the kind of ghoulish view that you, I think, rightly reject and, uh, and the view of God is love, uh, whatever else we say, uh, seems to me we should, we should take the latter. Uh, if, if you end up finding yourself saying, well, actually, I don't think either of those views is right. I'm not sure we can defend either of them. Uh, that's another conversation, of course, to have. But certainly, in minimum, I think the, the ghoulish view has to go. All right. Thank you. Interesting stuff. Uh, next up is Rod and then Peter following Rod. So Rod, well, you're up. Um, <laughs> First, I want to thank everybody for a profound and uh, interesting discussion. It's been uh, it's been great. Um, I want to bring a very simple personal perspective uh, 
to share this morning, and it's the prism of worship that I'm going to speak about for a few seconds here. To worship God, God, there's two key issues in my mind, and I will struggle with anything and everything that I can't personalize. To worship God, God must care, deeply care about me and each of you. That caring, God's caring is immutable. I can't negotiate that on any basis. The second point is that God or agents of God must be involved in a relationship with thoughtful homo sapiens, sapiens, you and me. It must be more than creator or, or a cognitive discussion about the immensity of God's realm. I must personally profoundly understand, meaning I must read and think and process what it is to be created in the image and likeness of God, meaning that inside and outside, we are like God, not in some precise way, because I recognize there's a gap uh, between divinity and humanity, uh, and humanity, and that's a given. But um, my understanding of likeness is an immutable cornerstone in my belief system. In short, if I have to abandon caring and relationship or the caring and relationship components of my belief system, then worship will surely cease. Uh, that's just a, a statement. It's not a question, Gary, but I, I believe that we each have to build a, a tenable theology, a defensible theology, something that we believe in. We have to have some cornerstone beliefs. And in my rebuild of a theology, uh, late in my life as someone raised in as a Seventh-day Adventist, um, my first cornerstone belief was around that word likeness and how profound it is and how much we have to think it through and my commitments began there take it away and then i'm back to being a non-believer a non-worship maybe a cognitive believer but a non-worship just a statement yeah i think a wise and uh, a wise and healthy one i'm reminded of john greenleaf whittier's poem the eternal goodness uh which uh, jack provancia of sainted memory used to like to quote um not and there's a lot more going on in the in the poem than this but the key lines that he quoted were not mine to look where cherubim and seraphs cannot see but nothing can be good in him which wicked is in me i think that that uh uh says something uh something very important that it, yeah if, if if that's yeah anyway Thank you. Thank you, Rod. Uh, I, I like what you've said, and I don't know that I have anything profound to add to it. I'll just cheer for it. Gary, can you, where was that from? I had not heard that quote before. Yeah. Right, so it's from a poem by John Greenleaf Whittier called The Eternal Goodness, um, which I think Provencia quotes in both um, God is with us and you can come home again. Thank you for sharing it and for the citation. Of course. Of course. Uh, Peter, thank you for your patience. We're back to you. Thank you. Uh, first, a quick answer to Donna that uh, asked when uh, the doctrine of Trinity was formulated. Officially, as far as I know, the official doctrine of Trinity was formulated in 325 AD at uh, Nicaea. The Council of Nicaea that came up with the creed, Christian creed that basically it's in existence until today. Now the question for Gary, uh, to enlarge a little bit our discussion, uh, how Jesus or, was perceived throughout the centuries. Uh, what do you think? Uh, can we make a connection about uh, uh, Plato with his uh, doctrine of forms, theory of forms, and let's say uh, different uh, other currents uh, like uh, Docetis and 
and others uh, saw Jesus. Do you see any connection? Can we make any connection between Plato and, and others? Well, I'm sure there are lots of connections that I'm not going to think of immediately. And since uh, uh, we're largely out of time, anything I say will be even more incomplete. I mean, if we think about John 1 and the idea of the Logos, which is, of course, not there in Plato, but it's Neoplatonist, it's rooted in, in, uh, in ultimately in, in Platonic ideas. And what we find, of course, is that the, yeah, the early Christians are, are using this idea of the Logos to make sense of Jesus, the idea that the, the Logos here, which is the, the structure, the order, the meaning, the underlying pattern in the universe comes to, to expression in the person of Jesus of Nazareth. Um, you know, I mean, I think that idea of the Logos in John 1 seems, even if it's, it's not there uh, explicitly in the uh, uh, in Plato, uh, certainly can be seen, you know, that we can think of the Logos as, as embodying uh, uh, ultimately all of those, uh, all of those forms, or at least mediating the forms uh, to expression in the, uh, in the created world. Um, you know, I think a, a kind of standard Christian view, of course, would be that the, you know, the forms uh, reside ultimately, a, a Christian, you know, reading of Plato would be the forms reside in the being of God, the forms are dimensions or elements of the being of God, which come to expression when uh, the created world is structured. So I think I think there's certainly a connection there. Maybe there's maybe there are other connections one might make but that would it seems to me be the, the standard way of thinking about it. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, thank you for your questions, Peter. Thank you, Gary, for responding to all the questions that were given today. And thank you, I don't say most of all, but thank you for coming on short notice to uh, present today. That's very helpful. And I know David was very appreciative of it when I talked to him last night. So um, I guess we're going to go to our foodless potluck. And I have, McKinley, I have made you a co-host. I may make you a host. Uh, so let's, uh, let's have our benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. Amen. By the way, um, Jeff Gang will be here next week. He's going to be talking about Bonhoeffer. So uh, you might be want to put that on your calendar. So at this time, Simona, what should I do? Stop recording. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Gary, and, you know, are you I able really to do spare five minutes? Uh, I'm, I'm out of here now at this point, actually. Uh, okay. check, get, check in with my wife and try to get uh, somewhat late lunch. Uh, <laughs> Okay. So